roommates or lovers? An age-old question. Today we're taking you on a journey through time to learn about the rich but often unsung history of leaders of the queer community. Lesbians. Let's do it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Queer Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Carbon. And I'm Emily. And welcome to the show. Hooray! Today, we're going to be talking about lesbians from the island of Lesbos. That's actually coming into into the programming sooner than you might think. Okay, I'm ready. Can you tell me why have we decided to do a whole episode on the history of lesbians? Well, I mean, we have a personal interest. But Mm. aside from that, I've been seeing a lot on the internet just about how lesbians have been such leaders in the queer community and how there's all these really interesting facts about us as well. But beyond that, we, of course, a month ago enjoyed the Dyke March, which is both of our favorite part of Pride. But Mm. one sign really piqued my interest. What did it say? It's this one person who is like constantly at the sidelines of the dyke march for like the past three years i've seen them and the sign always reads we would be nothing without lesbians it's true it's facts but today we're about to learn why though i love that so beyond that we also just watched a league of their own i know we're (laughs) a little late on that one for sure for sure (laughs) regrets no no regrets that we watched it too late no you have no regrets no regrets okay i respect that but we absolutely loved it and it really just like piqued our fascination of wanting to learn more. So one thing that I really want to flag, especially with this being an episode all about queer history, is that our history is so important to tell, first of all, because so much of it has been erased. And I I really felt this while I was digging into the history of lesbians and I was trying to find like specific facts about POC lesbians and lesbians around the world, is that our history really hasn't been very well kept. And that's why Queer Archives is just like really important initiatives of learning about ourselves. And yeah. and also like preserving our history as we continue to move forward. Okay, so let's get into it. Our journey begins, of course, in ancient times, where Classic. evidence suggests that same-sex love between women was celebrated and accepted in certain societies. Certain. Certain. Which kinds? The ancient ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in ancient Greece, for instance, the island of Lesbos. Here I we love go. the island of Lesbos, my favorite island where all lesbians originated from. It's always been like a joke of my dad's bringing up the island of Lesbos, being like, that's where you're from. But yeah. I never actually realized this is actually a legitimate part of lesbian history. And where you're from. Yeah, a (laughs) double-decker. Okay, so in ancient Greece, at the island of Lesbos, this is actually from which the term lesbian originates, fun little fact, but the island of Lesbos was known for its poet Sappho. This Mm. is where the plot thickens, who wrote beautiful verses expressing love and affection for women. These works are some of the earliest records of instances of lesbian identity and relationships in history. Is this where the word sapphic comes from? Beat me to the punchline. Ooh. Was it too obvious? So the poet's name is actually where the term sapphic comes from. And by Google definition, relates to sexual attraction or activity between women. But one thing I want to flag is that at its core, sapphic can be a lot broader. It can be lesbians, bisexuals, and pansexual people Mm. of a variety of genders, including trans femmes, masks, non-binary people, and cis women can all fall under the sapphic umbrella. Is it because it's like defining the attraction between women or? Yeah, I think it's also just like trying to like open up the term and make it more inclusive as well. A kind of an asterisk that it doesn't have to be just cis Lesbians. women with cis women. Gotcha. So one thing I really like about the word sapphic too is that it is considered a poetic word and it really describes the attraction between women to be something very like magical and spiritual. And I think that really comes from the origins of it being poetic. That's cute. So we're like a poem. Exactly. From ancient times, how does that then translate to the middle times? What happened in those middles? We're going now to the Middle Ages. Okay, perfect. You're so good at guessing. It's like you took history class. Okay, so for those of you who are stupid as hell like me and want to know the years, the Middle Ages was approximately the year 500 to 1400. Can you imagine existing in like the year 100? Well, 100 relative to what? Jesus Christ. Jeebus. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus Christ. They had no idea. The they time. had, but we don't actually know what <laughs> year like, it is. Now it's time to start counting. Let's get yeah, to yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, like, it's like the Christians were like, everybody, one, two, <laughs> three, on. eyes, eyes, four. eyes, four. And then everybody was like, okay, fine, five, <laughs> six. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> 
So now in the Middle Ages, we encounter a more complex reality. Bringing up Jesus Christ, because (laughs) in the Middle Ages was really when the rise of Christianity began. And this is when women who loved other women started to face a lot of scrutiny, punishment, and often even death. Man, the Christians really hated themselves some some homicidious back yeah. in the in the middle of the ages. Mm-hmm. A lot of them stay hating. They do stay hating, don't they? Where did they get this idea from that homosexuality bade? A lot of it was based kind of around modesty and colonialism. The stories of like Adam and Eve. I also know very little about Christianity because Fair enough. I was not raised religious. I feel like we could explore different religions with different people though. Comment well. if you want us to explore religion and him see she's now let's fast forward to the Renaissance period. Beyonce? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> This is her time. (laughs) A couple weekends ago in Toronto, this took place. So approximately the year 1400 to 1527. Mm -hmm. Despite the really oppressive social climate that was happening because of Christianity, this continued into the Renaissance period. Lesbian relationships continued to thrive in secrecy. We must push on. (laughs) So historical figures such as Anne Lister in the early 19th century, also known as, quote unquote, the first modern lesbian. Modern? Yeah, the Renaissance period. Modern? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whatever. Anne Lister really challenged conventional norms and lived openly as a lesbian woman, even though they had to be discreet about their identities in public. So what does that mean to live openly as a lesbian woman, but having to be discreet? That doesn't make sense to me. So part of it was that she was a successful woman entrepreneur and landowner, which like... She girl bossed. She girl bossed in a time when girl bossing was not... Allowed. Was not allowed. Get your fucking ass up and work. She kept an extensive diary, which was partly in code and reveals her many sexual affairs with other women throughout her life. Yeah, That's kind of saucy. Coded, though. So as we move forward in time, we arrive at the era of European colonialism. So the impact of colonization on queer communities worldwide cannot be overlooked. Can't. Don't overlook it. We're looking into it. Because we were just chatting about the Middle Ages, the Renaissance period, which was like very marked by Christianity and like oppressing queer people. And now we're starting to spread that. While indigenous cultures often had their own understandings of gender and sexual identity, colonial powers imposed their views and stigmatized non-conforming identities. Very classic of them to do. Including those of lesbians, of course. One thing I I do want to say is that while I was doing this research, I was finding everything that was coming up was extremely whitewashed. And so I started like really intentionally trying to dig for POC examples and Mm. just like examples of queer history in Africa and Asia in just like different countries around the world, different continents, and didn't find very much. Only found like very small pieces about homosexuality. I could find like gay men. I could only Mm. find a few things, still very, very scarce, but no stories that are like even comparable to Anne Lister yeah. in terms of like POC examples, so especially for that time. Even the, the archives mm-hmm. of queer people is very much integrated with classism, mm-hmm. with racism, with misogyny. And the reason that I say that is because if you look at the story of Anne Lister is that not only was she a wealthy white woman, mm-hmm. but to be able to even write yeah. in a diary, especially at around that and time. And own land. And well. own land, of course. But yeah. even just the privilege alone of knowing how to write language mm-hmm. was the only reason that we have something like this. This wouldn't... Yeah. Uh, there's plenty more mm-hmm. like her I'm sure not landowners and white, mm-hmm. obviously, but they just didn't have their history recorded because they didn't have access to certain tools. Mm-hmm. And that does come from like classism and education as well. Well, we don't have the POC equivalent of Anne Lister. What I was able to find are broader accounts about society's outlook on queerness and sometimes lesbianism that shed a bit of light on this topic in different places around the world. So I would love to take you all through that just so we can get kind of an idea of what the pre-colonial world looked like. Let's get on. So in Africa, in the pre-colonial era, many African societies had diverse understandings of gender and sexuality. Some tribes recognized the existence of individuals who did not conform to traditional gender norms and allowed them to occupy unique roles within their communities. For example, this next part I found really interesting and definitely ties into lesbianism. So for example, in some parts of Southern Africa, I might butcher this 
term, but the term Isith Walandwe was used to describe women who adopted masculine gender roles and were allowed to marry other women. It sounds like a bunch of lesbians to me. These relationships were acknowledged and accepted within their communities as well, which is really cool. Love that. Mm -hmm. So now let's chat about the Americas. So before European colonization, several indigenous cultures, as a lot of us know, in the Americas had varying attitudes towards gender and sexuality. Some tribes recognized the presence of two-spirit individuals who embodied both masculine and feminine qualities. So two-spirit people were often regarded with respect and held in important spiritual and ceremonial roles. Oh my God, with respect? Mm -hmm. How awesome is that? (laughs) Yeah, love some respect. So in some tribes, same-sex relationships between women were not uncommon and were accepted. So the last place I want to take you is the Caribbean. So similarly, some indigenous peoples in the Caribbean region had their own understandings of gender and sexual diversity. For instance, the Tano culture present in parts of the Caribbean, including present day Puerto Rico, there was a recognition of erito, which were ceremonial gatherings where same sex couples, including women, could dance and celebrate their love openly. Wow. Puerto Rico, Mm -hmm. another place taken over by America. So one thing that I find pretty sad is that a lot of the countries where these European colonial powers went and spread the word of Christianity Mm -hmm. and imposed a lot of homophobia and transphobia, these countries now enjoy a lot of equality and have pushed progress forward a lot thanks to queer rights movements. But a lot of these countries uh, where we've imposed colonialism on them still maintain really strict homophobia and transphobia. It's like, let me infiltrate your minds and your Mm -hmm. entire culture with this idealism Mm -hmm. that we have for which is colonialism, Mm -hmm. and then let us move forward while you stay behind. I think it really shows what type of responsibility that a lot of us have, especially as like queer activists in places where we enjoy a lot of freedom and equality, is that I I do think we have a responsibility to keep fighting for for folks around the world. Imagine me coming from a country like Colombia or just South America in general, where queer rights movements haven't progressed as much, Mm -hmm. coming to Canada, experiencing all the privileges and rights of such movements, Mm -hmm. only to find out my original land where I come from was far more progressive pre-colonialism. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting that you move to a more colonial part to get these rights where before it was just fine on its own. I feel like it's easy to revert back to, oh, the good old days, you know, before things were messed up by insert thing here. You could say by colonialism or by anything else. The reality is that probably nothing was ever perfect and probably there were a lot of issues. However, it really makes me sad that colonizers came to the country completely messed everything up and then sort of left us there to rot you can clearly still see the struggle today and arguably it's getting worse so to bring us back the 20th century brought both challenges and progress for the lesbian community in the early 1900s the suffragette movement brought an opportunity for women to unite including lesbian activists who fought for both gender and sexual equality what is suffrage so for those of you who don't know the women's suffrage movement was all about getting the women the right to vote in the 19th century and this particularly took place in great britain and the united states Because the women's were suffering. Yeah. So at the time, people who opposed the suffrage movement proposed that women who got the right to vote would become lesbians, (laughs) which I think makes a lot of sense. That makes sense (laughs) to me. I think if you wear pants Mm -hmm. and you have a say in what happens with society, then you're definitely gay. I think we're on to something here. What's really fun and interesting throughout the rest of this is when we start to get a little bit more information on actual history. So I have some fun little tidbits to include here. So postcards were a really popular form of communication in the 1900s. You could get a postcard delivered to you up to five times a day. So they were like texting, but with postcards? Yeah. The mail service was that fast? They were like running around. Maybe like the communities were tighter. So people who oppose the suffragettes really utilize postcards as like anti-feminist propaganda, really. In these postcards, we see many examples of suffragettes being stereotyped as ugly, man-like. They're going to cuck you and they're lesbians. I think this draws a really interesting 
comparison to how feminists are often categorized today. Do you think they were wrong? Were the suffragettes lesbians? Probably not all of them, to be fair, right? But I feel like a lot of them. So once again, an example of lesbians being leaders, LGBTQ plus historians have found through suffragettes diary entries, again, bringing diaries. in the diaries. So honestly, it's making me consider, I'm like, should I start keeping a diary? Because you want to be famous <laughs> later on and be like, Emily Jayoskos, Emily, Emily Oikos Yogurt. <laughs> Wrote the modern this day lesbian. Modern day lesbian wrote in her diary that <laughs> it'd be all about you, baby. And have a really saucy diary. Oh yeah. yeah. Would you change your lifestyle just to make your diary more saucy? Maybe for the history. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe you should get a diary then. I would like to see that. Now I'm just thinking about everything. I'm like, do it for the history. You know? Do it for the history. Yeah. I think you know, can we start that? Yeah, it's like I think it's a good way to live. Do it for the lesbian history. Do it for the lesbian history. I'm into it. And keep a diary. Yeah. So that the history is recorded. <laughs> so back into it. LGBTQ historians have found through suffragettes' diaries that many of them were in romantic relationships. Classic. Sounds With sick. one another. Stop. I thought they were roommates. <laughs> but what I will say is that while many of them were lesbians, not all suffragettes were in fact lesbians. Of course. Yeah. Next, we're going to dive into the lavender scare, which is fun because it is tied into... Purple? No. <laughs> because it's the time when A League of Their Own was taking place. It's the 1950s. True. Love League of Their Own. Love the 1950s, except for all of the misogyny, racism, classism. So, despite all these exciting things that have been happening with the suffragist movement, the 1950s drove the queer community even farther underground. This was all due to overt state-sanctioned discrimination. We've spoken a little bit about this before, but this time in queer history has been named as the Lavender Scare, which was a period of prosecution against LGBTQ plus individuals in the U.S. during the 1940s and 1950s and had long lasting impacts up until the 1990s. Prosecuted for being gay. Mm -hmm. Hey, you gay? Yeah. You know, we don't like your sort none. Go all up into jail, you going dang digging flabbit going in there. Jail. Great ad. This really all took place during the greater context of the Red Scare, which was a time of heightened fear of communist propaganda because oh. this was all taking place during the Cold War. So many people at this time with suspected ties to communism were being investigated and like potentially arrested. So the Associated Lavender Scare was based on the idea that gay men and lesbians were sexual inverts and they were easily manipulated, making us easy communist sympathizers and national security risks. So really what was going on at the time is that the government targeted suspected homosexuals and conducted investigations to remove them from federal employment. At this time, hundreds of people were being fired from their jobs, removed from the army, and we also saw that the ban on queer people in the army lasted it up until like the 90s as well. So where does the term lavender even come from? That's a really great question. Lavender is a common theme that comes up a lot throughout lesbian history. The roots of the term actually date back to ancient Greece with our friend Sappho, the poet from the island of Lesbos. So in her poems, she references purple blooms a lot. So this is kind of the first example of purple and lavender coming up in queer history. But it wasn't until much later in the queer inclusive 1920s Berlin where lavender really became a symbol for women loving women. So a song titled The Lavender Song had a line that says, lavender nights are our greatest treasure. And this is a lyric from a cabaret song. So this song was considered a queer queer anthem at the time. And around that time, lavender became shorthand for queerness. What's really interesting, I didn't realize that Abraham Lincoln was gay. Did what? you know this? Abraham? Yeah. Mr. Lincoln? Mr. Lincoln was like a little gay. Well, I found this, you know this. I found this out while I was researching. How do you know this? Okay, so we see the term lavender being used in Abraham Lincoln's biography that was published in 1926, which described him as having a streak of lavender. A streak of yeah, so lavender? Like, just a little queer. Was he bi? I was guess. Was he like cute little bi guy? I guess. Just like. <laughs> With his big top hat? Honest Abe top hat bi curious. I love it. Streak of lavender. Mm. Bi. It kind of makes me want to like put purple in my hair. Did he have a wife? I, I don't know. This is literally the only piece of information I know about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and I don't think I care to learn more. And <laughs> that he was honest Abe. Yeah. Now you know too. Was he really honest? I don't know. <laughs> That's but, just what you know. Well, no, I guess not because nobody mentioned his bisexuality. So the term lavender is coming back again in this next piece, which is the 60s and 70s, which is also characterized as the second wave of feminism. So we're going to be chatting about the lavender menaces. 
menace. Oh, they're a menace now. So despite the hardships felt in the lavender scare of the 1950s, the 1960s and 70s, the lesbian community grew stronger and we saw the rise of the second wave of feminism and LGBTQ plus movements. So lesbian activists were really playing a pivotal role in advocating for equal rights and visibility. So have you heard of the term lavender menace? I have heard of the term, yes. I don't know why they're a menace, Mm -hmm. but as we now know, lavender is tied to being fruity. Mm -hmm. So the term was originally an insult by famous feminist Betty Friedan. An insult. An insult. From a feminist? Yeah. So this Against lesbians? Yeah. You remember when we were talking about the suffragettes and people who were opposing the feminist movement, talking about women as being lesbians, man-like, cuckolds, etc. Yeah. So this rhetoric really continued into the second wave of feminism where some women even were getting upset about lesbians being included in the feminist movement because they felt like they were dampering it and taking away from their potential rights because a lot of the opposition was using words of hate against them. So they were like, you're pulling us down, basically. So they wanted to be exclusionary. So in the 1970s, a group of feminists reclaimed the word and named their group the Lavender Menaces, which they put all over their protest t-shirts and signs. Love that. Mm -hmm. So sadly, the second wave of feminism was definitely not characterized by being intersectional. The groups primarily focused on the issues of white, middle class, and rich women. So a lot of black lesbians had to create groups of their own in their own literature as well. The Combahee River Collective, also known as the CRC, was one of these groups in the 1970s that published a statement outlining the core concepts of intersectional feminism. So this is kind of like the interesting history in the black history of intersectional feminism really work. Mm, Love that. Love to see it. Exactly. So their work ultimately led us into the third wave of feminism, which was much more inclusive. It's interesting that like feminism as well as even just queer rights Mm -hmm. are still, even when we try to push forward so deeply rooted in racism, Mm -hmm. ableism, homophobia, classism. It's always just you're bringing us down rather than everybody get on board and let's push forward. Yeah. I think you have kind of like two subsets of people when it comes to that. So you have people like Betty Friedan who are actively working in against inclusivity Mm -hmm. in these movements. Makes no sense to me. And then you also have people who are just kind of oblivious to it because they're probably not exposed to people of color, especially when you're talking about society when it's like really close to segregation as well, where it's like people are still staying very segregated in their different spaces. We really see this in play out in A League of Their Own, kind of this obliviousness from Mm -hmm. the main character Carson. So she sits down and is having a conversation with Max, who is kind of like her black counterpart in throughout the TV show, I'd say. And they're talking and Carson's kind of like struggling with the team. It's all about baseball. and Sports. She was, sports. And she's like, it would be so much easier if you could just be on the team because Max is a really great baseball player. And Max is kind of like, yeah, it would be easier for you. Like right. what? Like, yeah. it, like just not being completely ignorant to all of the intricacies of the issues of like why it's not possible and what it would be like even if it was possible. Yeah, and how badly she would want that as well. Well, of course, you know, so yeah. I found that to be really interesting. I think that did a really good job of just showing while a lot of white people and like white feminists, white lesbians may have had good intentions, mm-hmm. them being so oblivious to the actual lived struggles mm-hmm. of people of color yeah. made them not very good allies. Totally. You know, so I think that really shows the importance of the CRC's writings about intersectional feminism, where it really lays it out. And then it starts to be kind of more common knowledge throughout feminism circles. Now we're moving into the 1980s, which a lot of you queer history buffs would know as the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. Now we're about to find out why the L comes first in the acronym LGBTQ+. Oh, actually, I didn't know that there was an order. It didn't used to come first. That's the interesting thing. Before the 1980s, it, it wasn't. The G used to come first. So it used oh. to be GLBT, which sounds like a weird breakfast sandwich. I would argue that they both do, but... That's fair. Yeah. 
<laughs> so 1981 specifically was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, mm. which was originally called GRID, the gay related immune disorder. Jeez. Yeah. When they thought it was specifically a homosexual disease. So due to a lack of knowledge and a huge amount of stigmatization around how AIDS spread, a lot of doctors, nurses and family members of those who were dying from AIDS didn't want to take care of them. That's wild. Yeah. So even though it wasn't uncommon for gay men to turn their back on lesbians, it was actually lesbians who stood up and took care of gay men during the heat of the pandemic. That is wild. So the lesbian sisters strike again, mm -hmm. leading the way. So they donated blood for blood transfusions. They provided care and comfort to those who were dying. That's wild. Mm -hmm. Another tidbit there is that during this AIDS epidemic in the 80s, mm -hmm. there was also, that was around the time where disco turned into punking and whacking mm -hmm. in the dance community, which was largely led by gay men. And then in the 90s, it completely fizzled out because most of them had died, unfortunately, from AIDS. Yeah. And whacking and punking was essentially extinct. Mm -hmm. And then it came back in the 2000s. Yeah. Thankfully, because people decided to start reviving the dance. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you could say that lesbians, in a sense, sustained the gay men long enough to revive what we know today as whacking. Mm -hmm. And without whacking, we wouldn't have such rich dance culture in the queer scene. Yeah, word. And I really feel like the AIDS epidemic is such an important part of queer history for so much of us to hold on to and know because we lost a whole generation oh, yeah. of gay men. Absolutely. And, and trans people as well. And that's such like a huge loss of knowledge when we're talking about holding on to queer history as well. Mm -hmm. It's like we were, we lost knowledge holders. Well, you know who had the knowledge during that time was the lesbians. The keepers of the knowledge. The keepers of the knowledge can we coin that i'm gonna put it on a t-shirt <laughs> lesbians <laughs> keepers of the knowledge <laughs> so beyond that while lesbians were largely unaffected by the aids epidemic those that were often went undiagnosed and ended up dying in silence and it wasn't until the pandemic was largely over and contained that researchers found out that aids can impact many more people than just gay men it everyone can, it can impact everyone lesbians trans people and everybody else cis people straight people mm -hmm. everyone can be impacted and so following the aids pandemic, a lot of community leaders decided that to honor the role that lesbians played during the pandemic, that the L should come first. That's cute. Yeah. So that's why it's LGBT. Yeah, baby. Etc. cetera. Et cetera. <laughs> the next part of our story is one that a lot of us can probably still remember because it happened in the late 20th and early 21st century. This time brought significant milestones for the queer community at large. So the recognition of same-sex relationships and gay marriage was a battle that was fought off of the hardship of the AIDS epidemic. So we've spoken about this in our gay marriage episode specifically. So I really recommend diving into that episode after this if you're interested in more information around the AIDS epidemic epidemic and gay marriage because we really did a proper deep dive there but I'll give you kind of the TLDR cliff notes version right now really what was happening at the time was these gay men who had long-term partnerships with their significant other and had been really um like disowned by their family members when they were dying of AIDS their relationship wasn't recognized so their partner often wouldn't be allowed in the room with them they wouldn't be allowed after their death death to collect half of their wealth and half of like the money that they had built together and the life that they had built together, a lot of that individual's wealth would then go to their family who had effectively disowned them. So this was really what sparked the light under our butts of why we needed to fight for gay marriage was really about the legal side of it. Right. Because at the time, and I would say like sometimes still to this day, gay marriage has never been a top priority because it feels like something that is so deeply baked in cishet ideology yeah and it doesn't necessarily always feel like it fits us i think modern days now we've seen the benefits and the legal reasons of why we should also be able to marry one another but we're also finding new ways to redefine what marriage can look like for queer couples totally it's really just like the legal process of like this is my significant other this mm -hmm. is my emergency contact this is who i want to be there if something happens to me yeah and now we're seeing it as like a celebration of love also totally so that brings us to today and i thought a really lovely thing would be as two lesbians sitting here chatting about lesbian 
American history would be to say what our goals and aspirations are for the community. That's cute. What are yours? Yeah. I think to continue fighting for an inclu- a more inclusive community would be definitely a goal, one where everyone feels equally safe. Yeah. I would say like as a fairly straight passing white lesbian, I definitely don't face the same struggles and challenges that a lot right. of other people in our community face. So I really want to make sure, especially like trans people, trans lesbians are able to feel safe. Love that. For me, I would say that we continue to push forward in terms of all uh, human rights movements, queer movements, but also taking more time to take a look at history. In particular, your own own history from wherever it is that you come from and taking a look at what happened that made it the country that it is today and learning about all the injustices that it took to get there and really honoring those that came before us because the more I learn about American history and even Colombian history the more that I appreciate where I really come from and the more that I realize how important it is to reclaim some of those things and also push forward with a new agenda, which is the gay one, huh? Mm, I love that. Preserving history. Preserve it, yeah. Preserving and learning about our history. Yeah. I think that's really lovely. And definitely a huge goal of like this podcast as well is like us having a desire to learn about our community and also like a strong desire to share and preserve that information. Yeah, and keep a diary because you never know what saucy reader is going to open it up in the future. Ooh la la. And make your life more saucy because the diary has to be interesting for the history for the history (laughs) yeah so that is everything that we have for you today if you like this episode make sure that you hit subscribe because we put out new episodes every single week and you don't want to miss them if you want to dive deeper into gay marriage make sure to click this video right over here and if you want us to cover another subgroup of the lgbtq2s plus community and its history make sure to leave a comment down below or contact us on social media to make sure that we know what to cover next all of the info is in the description down below until next time peace